Probably most interestingly, during her younger years, she was part of the Meglin Kitties acting and music troupe, which was a group of children 16 years old and younger, and included such famous actresses as Shirley Temple and Judy Garland. Hello, and welcome to our 30th installment of Fraser Fridays, where all the salads are tossed and all the eggs are scrambled. Today, we're looking at the sixth episode of Season 2, entitled The Botched Language of Cranes. This episode came in with production code 207, meaning chronologically, next week's episode takes place before it. The Botched Language of Cranes originally aired on November 1st, 1994 and attracted 23.8 million viewers, after taking last week off. This is an excellent rating for the show. Not only is it up nearly 3 million viewers from two weeks ago, but it's good enough to be the fourth highest rated episode of the season. Even with those excellent ratings, this episode doesn't come close to reaching Andy Ackerman's sixth episode of Seinfeld, which isn't up quite as much as Frasier from the prior episode, but it is up more than enough to still blow the competition away, coming in at 30.6 million viewers. While both these shows went up an impressive figure, the true winner this week is James Burroughs' Return to Friends, which is up over 5 million viewers from the previous episode, and only 300k behind Frasier. A truly impressive showing for Friends this early on in the series' run. David Lee returns to direct this week, while Joe Keenan returns to his writing duties. This pair last worked together on the award-winning episode, The Matchmaker. Coming hot off that, I can't help but feel the writing and directing duo this week burned through some of their best gags with that episode. There's still plenty of good here, but this episode doesn't come near to matching that one in heart or humor. With that said, there is an interesting connection to David Lee's first episode, I Hate Fraser Crane, that I want to touch on a bit later. One other interesting thing of note is this episode was actually one of the earliest written for season two. It was written during the show's first season as a sort of audition script for Keenan. We talked a lot more about his writing career in my matchmaker review, but suffice it to say, the team was so impressed with the script, he got the job as a writer in season two, and it was decided that this script was good enough to be produced as a regular episode. We open this week's episode with another new introduction, and that's a rainy cloud over the city. Given both Seattle's nickname, the Rainy City, and the topic of this week's episode, I found this to be the perfect opening for this episode. I can't imagine we're going to get any more new intros this season, as we've now done the same number of new ones as last season. But given we're out of production order, I also wouldn't be willing to bet against it. The episode opens with what will be a recurring gag this week, and that's Frasier's poor umbrellas just getting destroyed for various reasons. Frasier comments that his destroyed umbrella is supposed to be windproof, and he's not impressed with the results. I initially suspected this was just a ridiculous sitcom line, but there are actually windproof umbrellas tested to withstand the extremely powerful wind cases. There is a lot that could be said about umbrellas, but I don't think they're really relevant enough to go into here, other than to say, February 10th was National Umbrella Day, which we just missed here. After Fraser declares he wants no part in hosting a charity event for the church, because they snubbed him last year, he jumps on the opportunity to host the Teenage Seattle pageant. This is almost surely a reference to the Miss Teen Washington pageant, which helps pick the Miss USA and Miss Teen USA candidates, and is headquartered in Seattle. The Miss Teen USA pageant has been in existence since 1983, while the regular pageant has been around since 1952. There also is a Miss Teen Seattle, but based on what I could find, it's more of a scholarship program and hasn't been around near long enough to make a reference here. One other thing of interest, the very first Teen USA Beauty Contest, which is considered the precursor to Miss Teen USA, took place in 1959, and was actually just a photo contest 
voted on by the readers of Teen Magazine. Anyhow, right before we get to our guest caller, we have a weird sponsorship scene that feels kind of inconsistent with some of what's come before. The joke here is essentially all the sponsors Fraser has for the day are really depressing ones. And yeah, it's a funny bit, and the jokes land well enough, but it feels really contradictory after what we had in the Andy Ackerman-directed episode Selling Out in Season 1, during which time we learn Fraser is very particular about the sponsors he accepts, and certainly wouldn't just take one without seeing who it was from first. I like the blind reading gag a lot, and it reminds me of the excellent Brian Sack and Jack Helmuth podcast, Questful Material, where they read fake funeral notices and sample book chapters blind each week. But it doesn't work here in light of what we already know about Frazier, especially with how tight a grip his agent BB has on him. This issue aside, as we move into the episode, we get a guest caller. We didn't have any guest callers last week, but we actually have two of them this week, which makes up for it. The first guest caller, and the one during this scene, is Alfre Woodard. She's quite a prolific actress, and has won numerous awards and nominations during her career, including four Emmys, which ties her with Regina King for the most acting Emmys won by a black actress. She started her acting career off-Broadway in 1977, before landing her first television role the following year in the TV movie The Trial of the Moak. From there, she'd have a few starring TV roles in the 80s on both Tucker's Witch and Sarah, before spending most of the 90s doing movies, including Star Trek First Contact, Primal Fear, The Brave Little Toaster to the Rescue, The Wild Thornberries, K-Pax, and Annabelle. In more recent years, she's returned to the small screen with recurring your starring roles in State of Affairs, Luke Cage, C and Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Woodard is one of those guest stars that is simply a famous actress. In her personal life, Woodard is a Christian scientist and a member of a nonprofit organization that fights AIDS in Africa. We start our second scene with a dreary day in Seattle with rain pouring down against the windows and Fraser just waking up while Martin is deeply engaged in his newspaper. I'm glad we're getting another rainy episode there's been quite a few of them at this point, and even if we're not coming near to hitting our 43% of the time rain, we have an episode with rain frequently enough that it does really feel like it's raining a lot on the show. As nice a touch as the rain here is, that's not actually what I wanted to talk about. What I wanted to point out is how weird of a shot this is. We're looking at Martin from the left here and straight into Fraser's room. Normally when we have someone entering from the direction of Fraser's room, we look straight at Martin. Looking from the left here, we get a better look at the table set on Fraser's balcony than we ever have before, and can really see the ornate door frame leading to the back. But otherwise, this angle just feels weird and doesn't lend much new to the series. We do get a new Eddie gag in this scene, with the poor pup dressed up in ring gear Daphne picked out for him. Martin is, of course, not a fan of it, but Daphne says she has more costumes she's going to put on him. I like this back and forth between Daphne and Martin, as it fleshes out the relationship and shows more of that sassy and rebellious streak we've seen from Daphne in the recent past. After that, we get probably my favorite callback of the episode, where Martin says Derek Mann mentioned Fraser in his column this week. For those that don't remember, way back in the fourth episode, I Hate Fraser Crane, which is David Lee's first directorial effort for the series, we had a story involving Fraser getting into a spat with Derek Mann, who wrote an unflattering opinion piece about our favorite doctor. The episode ended without us never actually seeing Mann, so given this callback, I have to wonder if the eventual appearance of Mr. Mann is in the cards. And if it is, I hope it's a David Lee-directed episode. Once Fraser realizes a lot of people are upset with him for insulting Seattle, he starts to rant about how it's a miserable place anyways, and states that mildew is a state flower. For those wondering, the state flower of Washington is not in fact mildew, but is the Pacific or California rhododendron. Rhododendrons only bloom for about a week each year, and this Pacific breed of rhododendron is actually found primarily in Oregon 
although it is native in parts of both Washington and California. John Mahoney wins for best reaction shot this week after he gives Daphne a half-hearted apology and she says he's forgiven. Mahoney has the best little smirk on his face as Daphne walks out of the room. It really left me cracking up, and it was a nice change of reaction shot for Martin, who we usually see with bulging eyes experiencing shock over something one of his children said or did. Our next scene opens with three things I want to touch on. First is we get our second of three umbrellas that Fraser will destroy this episode. Each umbrella looks completely different from the previous one, and it's just a really nice bit of attention to detail. The second thing in this scene I want to call out is we have a new promotional poster in the hall for the radio shows. In the past, we've seen posters for both Bulldog and Frasier. This week, we get to see a Gill poster for the first time. It's right in line with the other posters we've seen, and it seems to have taken the spot of Bulldog's old poster from previous episodes. The final thing I want to call out here is the return of Father Mike, and just how awkward it feels here. This is George Del Hoyo's second of three appearances as the host of the religious show on KACL. Yes, he has a more substantial part later in this episode, but this scene bringing him back just felt weird. Frazier says hello to him, and Father Mike says, hello, Frazier, and then Frazier goes into the studio. That's it. Father Mike will return later in this episode, so I'm guessing this was just put in as a reminder that he's a member of the KACL family, but it felt incredibly awkwardly bulky. Given this is one of Keenan's first scripts, this may just be evidence of him being somewhat an inexperienced writer here. If I may backseat write for a moment, this scene would have worked much, much better and lost this really, truly awkward bit if we had had an actual joke with Father Mike here before Fraser went into the booth. Then there would have felt like there was a reason for his presence here beyond reminding the viewer that he exists. This brings us to our second guest caller of the week, who is appearing in her final appearance here. Sandra D was both a model and an actress, who was active from the time she was a child in 1954 at the age of 12, until the early 1980s. During that time, she was an extremely successful child model, and she continued to model from 1954 until 1957, when she moved to Hollywood and landed a role in Until They Sail. She'd stay extremely busy throughout the rest of the 50s and 60s, appearing in a ton of films, including The Restless Years, An Imitation of Life, A Summer Place, and Romanoff and Juliet. After that, her career began to decline, and throughout the 70s, she appeared in only a handful of TV shows, including Night Gallery, The Sixth Sense, and Fantasy Island. Shortly after this, she became a recluse and retired from acting due to a number of personal issues in her life. This spot on Frasier is the only acting job she did after 1983. Sadly, she died due to complications from anorexia in 2005 at the age of 62. Bulldog stops by to congratulate Frazier on beating his record for hate mail, and then quickly leaves. Like the Father Mike appearance earlier, although to a lesser extent, this doesn't feel like a great use of Bulldog's character, and he's gone nearly as soon as he appears. There's at least a few jokes here that makes his use worthwhile, but man, do I wish he'd hung around here for just a little bit longer. We start our next scene with Niles hooking up a cable box to the top of the TV, or at least attempting to, after Martin damaged the old one because the Seahawks lost. For those non-sports fans, that's Seattle's football team. That's not what I wanted to talk about here, though. What I wanted to talk about was the cable box. Unfortunately, after spending the better part of an hour looking over pictures of old cable boxes, I couldn't get any closer to figuring out what company the box is from or who makes it. If anyone has any knowledge about the identity of this box, I would love to know about it and add an addendum to this episode. Frazier's last damaged umbrella makes its appearance here, which is unceremoniously thrown into the hallway. This was a really fun gag for the episode, and one I'm really glad they did. I'm hoping this is a forebearer of things to come, 
and we'll see more one-off gags that last for whole episodes like this in the future. We have Roz show up at the apartment again. She's doing this more than more, which I really like. Granted, when she shows up, it's still pretty much always as a business partner, but I'll take all the Roz in the wild we can get. We also get Niles complimenting Roz in a backhanded but totally fitting kind of way here. I'm absolutely loving the new Roz and Niles dynamic this season. They work really well as, a, well, for lack of a better term, as frenemies. And the snideness with which half their comments to each other comes out is simply delightful. When Niles compliments Roz, he compares her to Nancy Reagan and her secondhand clothes. The event Niles is talking about here did actually take place. To help battle the controversy of her dressing too extravagantly, Nancy Reagan wore this outfit on stage to the tune of Secondhand Rose. And boy, is this outfit something. Today, you can actually see this outfit preserved behind glass at the Reagan National Library. Our final scene brings us to the charity dinner for the church and Father Mike's the actual scene after his weird, hi Fraser" moment earlier in the episode. We find Fraser sitting in a seat of honor beside Sister Josalia, who is editing his jokes to be church appropriate. The good sister is played by Helen Geller, not to be confused with Helen Keller. Geller is a minor actress who was primarily active in the 90s and early 2000s. She has 18 credits to her name, including The Nanny, The Practice, ER, Will and Grace, Dan Scrubs. Probably most interestingly, during her younger years, she was part of the Meglin Kitties acting and music troupe, which was a group of children 16 years old and younger, and included such famous actresses as Shirley Temple and Judy Garland. We get a really funny tidbit about Maris, who has actually managed to show up to a function instead of finding some reason to stay home, which is a first for Niall's wife. Of course, we don't actually see her, but we get a ridiculous play-by-play -play while she stalks her prey, and it turns out to be one of the best parts of the episode. The last thing I want to touch on here is Martin gives Fraser the advice to just act like Carson if one of his jokes bomb. Johnny Carson is a little before my time for The Tonight Show, but you still hear a lot of people talk about how he was the best host on The Tonight Show. And after perusing his back catalog, I have to say, Martin is absolutely right here. If a joke didn't land well, Carson just made fun of it and moved right on. That's a cool reference to a legend, and considering it had been Leno's show for three years at this point, it shows just what kind of a cultural impact Carson had. The episode winds down with the funniest bits of the episode here, where Fraser tells horrible joke after horrible joke about the lost bishop after he misses the announcement about him being lost. It's a clever ending to the episode and works really well as a cap off here. The coda coming off this couldn't work better from what we've had come beforehand, and as an obvious sequitur, it works perfectly and feels like Fraser has finally earned some sort of redemption for his mess ups during this episode. We're pretty light on ties this week, with two ties for each Fraser, then Niles, and one of the rare ties for Martin. Fraser's only tie this week is making its fifth appearance, after last showing up in episode 19 of season 1, while Niles' tie is actually new here, although it bears a lot of similarities to a tie he last wore in episode 19, just with a different pattern at the center of the design. All three members of the Crane family wear bow ties this week. This is Fraser's third outing with a bow tie, and Niall's second. This brings us up to 33 unique ties for each brother, and again makes it a tie. This marks the fifth time Martin has worn a tie, and his second time wearing a bow tie. This is a mid-tier Fraser episode for me, but given this is actually Keenan's first script, a lot of the more generic elements we've seen here are forgivable. That, coupled with the fact that they must have made a few script changes from the original Season 1 writing of this, particularly with Raw's then Niles dynamic to update it to where it currently is, makes me wonder how much of this script changed between its initial writing and its filming, which may account for some of the oddities we see here. Among the oddities is the aforementioned Father Mike scene. It just felt so weird, and I really hated its inclusion. We already talked about it a lot before, 
and there's not really anything else to say on the topic, other than to give Keenan the benefit of the doubt, and assume there was more there in the original script that got edited out. That issue aside, we've got a lot of good in this episode. We have the aforementioned Great Niles and Roz dynamic. We have an incredibly cool late-day guest star with Sandra Dee's final performance. And we have a new Eddie gag, which I had half expected us to have run out of by now. I don't want to see a lot of Eddie in costumes, but if it happens a few more times, I surely won't complain. When it comes to the rating for this episode, oh man, it's all over the board. But thanks to the strength of the final scene, even if it is a classical misunderstanding at heart, this week's just squeezes out an 8.0 out of 10 for me.